which had been away in Mauritius for Bible school for about six months. And we came back, we were living with my parents, we were both obviously unemployed. And the Lord thought that was a good time to bless us with an unplanned <laughs> pregnancy. And it was quite a, a shock, obviously, at first. But, you know, the shock gives way to joy. We saw the Lord provide miraculously for all of her needs. You know, you get this list when you fall pregnant, everything you need for a baby, and you think, Lord, how are we going to do this, you know? But His blessings were just abundant in that time, and we both ended up, obviously, with jobs and moving to our own little place. And for me, I don't know why, but it was just always that way that I really wanted um, a girl to the point where Rich was quite nervous for us to find out um, what we were having because he was not sure of my <laughs> reaction if it wasn't a girl. I remember the gynecologist appointment and he said, no, it's a girl. And I literally said, oh my gosh, sometimes the Lord does give us what we want. And he kind of <laughs> looked at me, but that was, you know, he doesn't um, owe us anything. He didn't owe us a girl, but he just gave us the, the desire of our heart. And I was just so happy you know I was really ecstatic quite early on we named her Isabella Naomi Wilshire Isabella means pledge to God she really yeah was a, um, a little person to us from so from so early she was the first girl on both sides of the family and everyone was very excited every gynecologist appointment went well and he was always happy with her and me and I was in a baby group and quite a few of those girls had, you know, serious scares. Um, and for me, it was just nothing really seemed to go wrong. And she was well and I was well. A few weeks from her due date, we went to see the gynae and he just wasn't um, happy. He couldn't put his finger on what the issue was. But basically, my amniotic fluid had gone down and she had stopped growing and my BP was a bit up, but nothing like alarming. He just felt that to be um, safe, it would be better to seizure her two weeks early. This was on the Friday. So I was put on bed rest um, and told to monitor her movements that weekend, which we did very thoroughly. <laughs> and yeah, I remember the Sunday night before, we were talking through all our lasts, last full night's sleep, last, I don't know, well, we couldn't even sleep in, but you know, all the lasts we'd had, last date night or last, um, all of those lasts, but obviously also all the firsts that were to come. And she'd been moving, we'd be monitoring movement all that weekend and everything was, was fine. And um, we checked into avenues at six that morning and we could hear all the babies crying, you know, you're in the maternity ward and now we're talking about all the firsts, you know, that are to come. And I, I don't even remember uh, what we were talking about, but we were laughing and laughing and laughing, me and, and Rich, my husband. And, and um, yeah, just talking about what our future now looked like with this, this life, you know, your whole life prepared for this arrival and how it's going to change in just a few hours. And it's, um, it's a mind boggling thing. You know, procedure is that before you, you go in for surgery, they check for, for the heartbeat. She came with and looked and looked and couldn't find her heartbeat. I remember she said to us, don't worry, don't worry. I think it's just the batteries in this thing, you know, don't panic, I'm sure your baby's fine. I don't know how long, maybe 15 minutes or whatever. And they got another, a different one and um, brought that and tried again and nothing. By this stage, obviously, we were uh, getting more and more upset. And again, she was like, stop crying, don't worry, your baby's fine, you know, it's, I'm sure it's just this machine. And, um, me, the lady in the bed next to me parts the curtain and says, stop crying, your baby's fine, don't worry, you know. Meanwhile, this lady goes and uses the same machine on this lady's tummy and finds the heartbeat and um, and we're sitting there thinking, this is this actually happening, you know. 
And then they need to get the bigger machine now from upstairs, but it's being used, so we have to wait about half an hour. Bring this down, try again, no heartbeat. So now we need to go for a, a scan. It's in use, we have to wait. Then we get there and the guy's now doing the ultrasound. And while he's doing it, his phone rings and he answers his phone and he's talking on his phone and my husband's like now going crazy. He's like, excuse me, excuse me. So he like puts the phone to the side and he's like, yeah, no, your baby's dead. And carries on talking on the phone. And I just remember screaming and screaming and screaming. I was on the, the bed and I just pulled the, the sheet over my head and I just screamed and screamed and screamed. Um, Richard was just kind of in shock and um, they wheeled us back to the maternity ward and obviously all the nurses were shocked and I was just screaming and screaming and screaming and uh, eventually, I don't know how long it took, Dr. Suddens came, he had put another surgery before mine because it was a, a, an emergency or something. And he was in um, shock and I, they hadn't called him in all this time, you know. And I just remember him tears in his eyes you know and they wheeled us eventually out of the maternity ward into a, a room we called all the family and obviously no one really knows what to say or how to respond and funnily enough well funny but a few months before we had gone up to Nyanga and my mother-in-law shared her story of how with her second child, Shelley, she had had a stillbirth. And I was sitting there holding my tummy and I just said, oh, I could never go through that. I could never do that, you know? And here I am, you know, in the same place. And we were given options whether to be induced or to have a, a caesarean. Dr. Sutton said from that first time, he said, your next babies, I will season them early you will not have a natural birth. And we had to wait now quite a few hours. Um, I remember it very clearly lying in this room and I couldn't eat or drink anything and it was so hot and I just was so, 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 so thirsty and crying and crying and all our family just kind of standing around. They put me under for the surgery and the next thing I remember was waking up in the recovery room after surgery, crying and crying. And a nurse came to me and said, what's wrong? Are you in pain? And I said, my baby's dead. My baby's dead. I remember being wheeled back into that same room and Richard came in and he looked so different. He was, he was so at peace, almost um, glowing. That sounds ridiculous. And, and he just said, Ash, I've just been praying and I've met with the Lord. And I really feel that we have to accept that this is His will. And that we have to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And He had changed in that room. He had really met with the Lord. And He found the strength to accept. And I also, in that moment, could find that strength to accept, Lord, this is your will and maybe we don't understand. But he causes all things to work for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And we got to hold her and we debated taking pictures of her. But you know, to us in that moment, she was so perfect and she was so beautiful. She had thick, thick black hair and she had my nose and longest little fingers and she was so perfect to us but the truth was obviously by that time she was blue and bruised from the forceps and we wanted to remember her as perfect how she was to us and in my memory that's how I see her you know so we didn't take any pictures sometimes I've <laughs> regretted it but at the same time our memory of her is, is, is as it should be. 
you know, somehow we could rejoice in the fact that this life had not known the pain and, and, and sorrow of earth, of, of this world and this life. But she had gone from the warmth and the perfection of my womb to the loving embrace of her Heavenly Father. And she's only known perfect joy and perfect peace and perfect love. She's never known anything else. And so we could rejoice in that, you know. I was in the hospital for quite a few days. They kept me heavily sedated. And I often woke up crying and crying. And I just replayed every single moment in my head over and over and over. It's like every memory is still so crystal clear in my mind because I've, I've lived them so many times. I really, in, in that time, I am. You could relate to the psalmist where he says, tears have been my food day and night, you know, and groaning comes to me instead of food. And, and that deep anguish, that deep sorrow, that deep pain, you can't imagine what it is to hold your dead child in your arms. There's no pain like it. And at the same time, there's no love like it, you know. Before you have a child, you don't understand what it is to love a child. And in that moment, dead or alive, that love of a parent completely overwhelms you and there's, n there's nothing like it while at the same time experiencing that, that unbearable anguish of, of losing a child. And you know, we had to find the Lord in that time. In the midst of our pain and our anguish, we had to find Him and we had to cling to Him, you know. And there's so many memories, I mean, leaving the hospital, we went down the elevator and we're next to a couple who's leaving with their newborn child and they're ecstatic. And <laughs> We've got a, a baby bag packed in long forgotten excitement and we go and an empty car chair, you know, and come home to an, a nursery and I couldn't believe that uh, empty arms could feel so heavy, you know, with the longing for a child. It's like your whole body, everything is prepared for this child. We um, decided another thing that AD advised us was to have a memorial service. She really regretted that. On the morning of the service, my milk came in. If you haven't experienced it, you don't even understand how painful it is w because you can't do anything about it because uh, it, it encourages more, more milk, so you have to leave it. And it was absolutely excruciating. And my whole body is, is prepared for this child, you know. And I was lying in the bath just trying to relieve some of the, the pressure. And at the same time that morning, my mother was, was very ill. She was not well. She couldn't even visit me. And she had fallen and, and cracked her, her head. I had to go and help my dad to, to bath her and, and clean her up and sort her out. And now I was just in the bath after that. You just feel hard pressed on every side, you know. And that scripture came to me from Job. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. And it was amazing how the Lord encouraged me from Scripture. And I didn't even really read my Bible, but He was constantly bringing um, verses to my remembrance that now had, had true meaning to me, you know. And he, he encouraged me constantly and comforted me through His Word. You hear about beauty for ashes. And for us, the, the beauty for ashes was not a happy ending. For us, it was finding the Lord in the midst of our sorrow and our grief. And we experienced the presence of the Lord in a way that we never have before or even since. It was a depth of fellowship. Paul says, I long to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings. And we knew the comfort of the Lord. When we knew the peace. When He talks about a, a peace that surpasses understanding, unless you've been in a, in a, in a place that that is beyond your capabilities. You don't need that peace, you know, but we experienced that peace. It didn't make sense. I had someone say to me, and I knew what she was saying, but she said, I'm so jealous of you. And she wasn't jealous, obviously, that we'd lost a child, but she was jealous because she could see um, how close the Lord was to us and how the Lord carried us and, and His grace that was there for us. We experienced the grace of God. We had the memorial for her and 
life kind of carries on, I guess. I think one of the the hardest um, the hardest things actually um, in that time for me was learning to forgive. I remember the first thing I said to my dad in the hospital was, "I will never have a baby in Zimbabwe again because of." the whole way we'd been treated and it was dealt with and immediately that scripture came to my heart that if if you don't forgive others the Lord will not forgive you and I had to release immediately we had to release and forgive and um, obviously since then when we've had our our boys the same woman have looked up to me and my children and to see how free I was in my heart was a miracle you know and at the same time, people, when you go through grief and suffering, people can be very um, insensitive. And often I found it's not because they want to hurt you, they just don't know what to say sometimes. And out of awkwardness, they say sometimes very hurtful things. And it was a constant process for me of having to forgive and release and forgive and release people. And. That was one of the hardest things, especially because it goes on for so long. You know, people can think that there's a time limit to grief, but it's still, our grieving process was still very long and very painful, especially for me. And I would say from six months maybe was even the hardest. Also because from the trauma, I stopped ovulating and I was unable to fall pregnant again. My doctor advised me to fall pregnant as soon as I could, but um, I, I stopped ovulating. So I had to go on fertility treatments. And so mixed with the, the grief of losing a child is the grief of not having a child and wanting a child, which also is a terrible suffering. And I can really um, sympathize and have a heart for women who are going through that because I had a taste of it, you know, a deep longing for a child that you can't fulfill. I read a quote um, that faith trusts God in the middle of the story. I had to say, you know, we can get so focused on a happy ending, but we need to trust the Lord in the midst of what we're going through. And you know, when we read the Bible, we have the privilege of seeing the ending. But these people who lived these things, they didn't know what the ending was. You know, when you think of, of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den, we read that story so casually because we, we know that God shut the mouths of the lions. But, but that man, he did not know what was going to happen. The king says to him, may the God you continually serve save you. And his testimony was incredible. And the next day the king rushes and says, has the God you continually serve saved you? You know, and there we have this image of these nice friendly lions, you know. But the, the men who, who uh, made the king enforce that decree, them and their families are thrown in after Daniel and it says their bones were crushed before they even hit the ground. So we read this story, but but Daniel had to trust God in the middle, you know, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, before they go into the fire, they say, God is able to save us, but if not, he is still good. And they see a fourth man walking in the fire with them and not even their hair is singed and they had to trust God, but they did not know you know, we see this wonderful ending where the king now um, promotes them and he sends this decree around all of Babylon saying, this is the true God, you know. But how did they feel? They had to trust the Lord. You know, Esther, when, uh, when she's told, Mordecai tells her to go before the king, she says, don't you know that if you go before the king before being summoned, you will be put to death? And he says, you've been brought to the palace for such a time as this. And she says, if I perish, I perish. And she goes before the king. Even Paul, when you read, no one, I don't think any man suffered more than Paul. When you, when you read what he's gone through, shipwreck, beating, beatings, flogging, stoned. I mean, it's just endless what this man suffered, you know? And he says, I count these present sufferings as, as nothing to be compared with the eternal glory that lies before me, you know? And he was a man that lived for eternity. And he says, death is at work in me, that life might be at work in you. And these were people that had to trust the Lord in the middle of their stories. Job, he's sitting on the ash heap and he has broken pots in his hand and he's scraping his boils. And he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and in the end, he shall stand upon the earth. And his wife says to him, 
curse God and die. And he says, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good and not evil from the hand of God? We have to accept good and evil from his hand. And someone said to us in that time, everything that God does is his goodness and his love towards us. And for us, that was a word from the Lord for us. It really kept us. And we had to accept this is his goodness. This is his love towards us. Everything he does. Whereas we like to classify blessings as, as certain things. And you know, when you read the book of Job, we read in the beginning how Satan goes to the Lord and the Lord says, have you seen Job, my righteous servant? There's none like him. And you know, Satan basically asks to test him. And the Lord allows, he, he hands Job over to Satan to test him. For 33 odd chapters, Job and his friends go back and forth about why Job has gone through. Because it's natural that when you go through things, whys and what ifs and if onlys they're the first thing that come to you if only we had seized it early why go, let us go through nine months and then take our baby away you can go back and forth until you lose your mind and for 33 chapters they're going and job saying i'm a righteous man i don't deserve this and his friends say god only punishes the wicked and they go on and on and on 38th chapter it says God answered Job out of the storm in my mind I think he would explain to Job and say well you know this is what happened Satan came to me and I knew know that you're such a righteous man and blah. he never explains anything he goes on and on and he says where do the mountain goats give birth who puts the sun in its place? Who sets the boundaries of the ocean? And he says, tell me, you are so wise. You've lived so many years. This is how he talks to Job. Who made the clouds? All these things, you know? And he goes on and on and on. And it says at the end that Job puts his hand over his mouth and says, how can I reply? I repent in dust and ashes. What the Lord does in the midst of our problems, he doesn't give us the why, he doesn't give us the reason, but he shows us himself. And when, when we see him, then we don't need answers because he himself becomes the answer. He himself becomes the solution. And we see how great he is and we see our, our smallness in compared to him. And somehow we can accept. And when we find him in the midst of it, it's enough, it's enough. Just like Job found God in the midst of it. And he says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And when we find the Lord in these unexpected places, that's enough for us. You know, just like the, the, that Bible talks about the, the beauty for ashes, um, but we find him there in, in the ash heap, you know, that's where we find him. And we found him when we came home to an empty nursery that um, was made with such love. We found him in, in, the, in the quietness of, of a house that should be filled with the joy of a child. We found him when empty arms feel so heavy. And we had to find him in our grief and we had to find him in our suffering and we did we found God in unfulfilled desires you know for me I I always wanted a girl I don't know if that desire will ever leave me I don't think you know, if that desire will ever be fulfilled but even there I've had to find the Lord each one of us we have to learn to accept and that's where healing is and that's where fellowship with Christ is it's in that acceptance the other amazing thing is what a great teacher suffering is and how much we learned and how much the Lord taught us in that time and the depth that it can bring to your life. And I read a, a poem and it says, I, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and never a word said she, but oh the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. And we did. We learned much from this companion called sorrow that the Lord has chosen to give us in life's journey. Even Paul, you know, he constantly talks about sharing in Christ's suffering, but the truth is that 
life holds trouble and life holds suffering and even just the mundaneness of life monotony of life there we need to find the Lord sometimes it's easier when we go through a tragedy to find the presence of the Lord and to be close to him but the challenge for me is today today in what I'm facing and I, I'm facing things every day maybe it's not on the same degree in the way we like to box things but every day I face challenges and every day I need to find the Lord. God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation, but it's the incarnation. And it's, it's Jesus Christ himself, you know, and how he came into this world and how he was broken and how he was rejected and how he suffered, all that he bore for, for our sakes, you know. He was rejected of men, he was despised, he was bruised, you know, for our, for our iniquities and like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, you know, and that is God's arm ultimate answer Jesus is in us and so as we suffer he suffers as we mourn he mourns he really is the 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 answer for us and scripture is so so clear that as we suffer um, we, we become more like him it must have been about a year of trying to fall pregnant um, once again I had to come to the place of accepting um, we even um, started meeting with people to do like foster care or adoption and so we we kind of started looking into this process and thinking maybe this is what the Lord has for us and um, we had to accept that maybe this whole thing is not going to play out how we think I really released it I really did to the point where I actually started training for a um, a walk from Harare to Bulaway and we went to Mauritius and um, for a, a church conference and there was another um, pastor there from Kenya who didn't know our story or uh, anything that that was happening at the end of the lunch he just said I just want to pray for you guys he prayed for us and he prayed for healing for me not knowing the, the situation and then afterwards he had a word and he said um, you've been through a time of great sorrow but the Lord is bringing a season of, of great joy. <laughs> and in my mind, I didn't even want to think that um, that was a child because joy can be many things, uh, you know. Anyway, we, we carried on with our lives and I carried on training. And as it turns out, I, I fell pregnant in Mauritius with um, Elijah. And um, it was a real su surprise. I remember uh, I, I went for a 25K and I almost fainted <laughs> and I got home and I just slept the whole day didn't know what was wrong with me and then I for me every time I fall pregnant I either think I'm dying or I'm pregnant <laughs> it's one of those two it really feels so terrible anyway we did a test and we were pregnant and um, I was determined it was a girl a few weeks later it was not a girl <laughs> but once we had um, again accepted of course we were so joyful and and again my, my pregnancies are high risk I'm monitored closely and especially the growth of the baby and my amniotic fluid and um, always towards the end of my pregnancy things start going a bit pear-shaped doctor sees it Eli about six weeks early he was in neonatal or for about a week or so I have such a clear memory of after that uh, Caesar waking up in that same recovery room and crying and crying and crying and the nurse saying to me, what's wrong, are you in pain? And I said, my baby's alive, my baby's alive. And then when he was six months old, I felt pregnant again. <laughs> Very unexpected. And Micah was the same thing. I went in for my appointment around seven, eight months, somewhere there. And the doctor just wasn't happy. He couldn't put his finger on it, but he wasn't happy. And he said to me, let's pray. And we prayed and he just said, no, I really feel that I need to take this baby out. We went into surgery a couple of days later and they couldn't find a heartbeat. And he operated very quickly. As he opened me, he, he said, we, we were just in time. We've almost lost this baby. And he just kept saying, thank goodness I listened. Thank goodness I listened because he listened to the Lord, you know. Again, Micah was in the neonatal and we almost lost him a few times. The Lord's just help, helped me to just put these babies in his hands. And now today we have a two-year-old and a three-year-old and our lives are very, very full and very busy and 
having kids in itself is no walk in the park. Our life is not perfect now because the Lord's given us these wonderful gifts. I'm lucky in that the Lord's given me a way to be creative and be with Him. It's an escape for me and I love it and I, I feel very blessed uh, to be able to do that. I listen to sermons while I paint and, and now it's become a time for me and the Lord. And I've named my studio Isabella's Place because for me she changed us. The Lord chooses to use us to make people, you know, and it's like she's not in heaven for nothing, but He has a purpose for Him. For me, I found her life has not been in vain because her ministry has been profound, not only in our lives, but in the lives of, of so many others. The Lord's used this experience to open the doors for us to have a heart for people who go through suffering. She, she's still our child, you know. Gone but not forgotten. That man stopped all his nails. What's he Thank <laughs> you.